So, a very, very warm welcome to you. Um, thank you very, very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, this is both a bit of a celebration um, where we're celebrating the fact that Sphere's been around for 25 years. We're also going to be reflecting on the last 25 years as well as looking forwards. Um, we're going to be critical, um, both negatively and positively, um, about Sphere. Uh, we don't have any Chatham House rules, um, and we are going to be recording this session, and we're going to put it on YouTube later, um, just to let you know. Um, but first of all, just to help melt the ice, if there is any, in the room. And if you have a neighbour, I see yours doesn't have a neighbour neighbor yet, but if you have a neighbour um, and would like to, please turn to your neighbour and just for a couple of minutes, share why you've come here. Why are you in the room? What's brought you uh, out of interest in Sphere or what's your connection with Sphere? So just turn to your neighbour for a couple of minutes and just share. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's fantastic energy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't, can you hear me? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, wonderful. Um, amazing energy in the room. Thank you. And just to let you know, which is probably why you're here, is that there is cake afterwards. Um, so please stay around um, and continue sharing and meet some other people, old faces, new faces. So please, um, if you can, enjoy us till uh, 12.30 and please join us in a little bit of a celebration. So first of all, a really um, warm welcome and a massive thank you to our panelists. Um, we really appreciate the preparation they've done before coming here um, and for agreeing to share this morning. So on the panel um, is Gabriel Kodoy Cirillo, Hubo Tuba Siddiqui, Susanna Davis, Paula Reed Lynch, and Nicholas Stockton. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing what you're going to say later. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of introductory words. I'd also like to thank Vanda, who's going to be our facilitator um, for the panel, and we'll have a Q&A session as well later. So, yeah, if you've got any questions, um, please hold them for the Q&A session. Okay, so the idea of a major step forwards in quality and accountability improvement in principal humanitarian aid came out of the refugee camps in Goma, just over the border from Rwanda, following the horrific genocide in 1994, when we got it all wrong. Traumatized refugees were badly let down, and indeed many aid workers were also badly affected as they struggled to cope in the aftermath of one of humanity's most terrible chapters. I can't imagine the horror. Aid agencies are very good at the who, at branding, at PR, fundraising, promoting ourselves. And we do so in competition with many others who are all doing and saying roughly the same thing. Even while we are on the dance floor, we are constantly looking around for more dance partners and dreading the music to stop. So we talk a big game and we show our best side. We're also good at the why. We say that the humanitarian charter, the humanitarian principles separate us from caregivers because we give primacy to affected people in a watertight, dignified and ethical way. What we don't say is that the principles are really hard. They are gray. They are often pragmatic and means to an end principles rather than absolute moral values. And we are not so good at the what. The minimum standards state that humanitarian aid should reach this low bar, not the maximum standards, 
not the median standards, but the minimum standards. And, and we do this because we care about people's dignity and their rights. However, due to many constraints, we often fail to match up what people want and need to what we can offer. And at its crudest in several contexts, we can only offer a potluck supply of items such as cash or services. Little choice often equals little dignity. And we struggle to catch the how, to crack the how. We struggle with communication, with community engagement, with expectation management, with respect and conveying dignity, with building relations, building trust. It can be partly taught, it's partly character, but the rest is constrained by the organization and by the context. And the reasons are complex and interconnected. I've spoken with several retired aid workers from the World Bank, from the UN, from NGOs, who sometimes often say the same thing, that development has failed, and read countless articles, particularly in the last 10 years, that the humanitarian aid system is broken, or broke, not broken. And yet the WFP's income went up from nine to 14 billion last year. There are still many hundreds of international NGOs in the fight for access and funding across all low-income countries. And I saw this like last year in Moldova, but the great ship sails on because there is no new system to render our existing reality obsolete. So the long-term camps of displaced people where hope is often just a smoldering wick, those on the front line of climate change and no way of saving their home, their inheritance, and those trapped in chronic poverty, these are the millions of people who are still not able to sit at the table where decisions about their future are made. Despite this, my belief is that we have to keep going. We need to work with what we have because we can't give up and we can't walk away. The core humanitarian standard, for example, is very good. It was distilled from a wealth of experience and knowledge and is being put into practice by many international and national agencies around the world. It's useful as a voluntary code and also as a basis for performance verification, which is really important because it's easy to get away with being accountable to the least powerful. It's easy to be accountable to those, to the managers, to the donors, um, but it's easy to get away with being accountable to the least powerful. So because of this, we do need a performance verification, which is not just a box ticking exercise or lip service. And that can enable us to get it right so that we can show we're walking the talk. The Sphere Handbook is a must have resource for thousands of aid workers and policymakers. It's 25 years old. The book is often a treasured possession. And in fact, it's one of the first items to be packed alongside a toothbrush and a phone charger. Can anyone relate to that? Putting that handbook into your bag with the toothbrush and phone charger. And it's a very special book for us, for humanitarians, because it is so useful. It's the embodiment of many hundreds of experienced and knowledgeable experts who have poured blood, sweat, and tears into drafting and redrafting each word and each number. And it's until it is as good as it can be. And this includes the humanitarian charter as well as the technical chapters. And if you wanted someone to sign your copy of the handbook, I wonder who you'd get to sign it, because it'd be necessary to ask countless authors and contributors. And that's why it's so special. It's from the many, for the many. So the strength of sphere, and now the many focal points. And I'm delighted that there are a few focal points, um, trainers and trainers of trainers and champions with us today. They're ensuring that the baton is passed on to the next generation. And in fact, this recent photo is taken from very near to where those refugee camps were located in Goma. And it says far more than I could ever say. My final slide, I just want to do a plug now for the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. It's a network of 10 standard setting initiatives. And Sphere hosts this partnership. In fact, we're hosting a, a meeting this afternoon of the partners. There's a website, there's an application. So do consider downloading, if you haven't already, the HSP app onto your phone, your mobile. And going forward, we want to drive more collaboration, harmonization, 
and simplification. Thank you very much. I'm now going to pass over to Vanda, who's going to lead us in the session of panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. And uh, just basically built upon what William mentioned in the Humanitarian Standard Partnership, just to break in the ice. Is anyone already have the HSP in your mobile phone? Super, thank you very much. So for those who still not have it, you will have time before the end of the session or before you leave Geneva to also, or this uh, Humanitarian Network Partnership Week to have it on your mobile phone. So when you've been deployed or when you are talking to your uh, partners or when you uh, work in the um, disaster area, you don't need to wear the book It's one option, but you can also have on your mobile phone. Thank you very much. Um, uh, secondly, who already ever attend a sphere training? All right, super. And who is sphere trainer in this room? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your support. Really, really uh, appreciate it. And final, final question before I turn to, into our discussion. Um, who among all of us in this room commit to continue using Sphere and the other humanitarian standard in your work? Perfect. Well done. So thank you so much. My name is Fanda Lengkong. I'm from Plan International also serve as a Sphere board member, and I will be moderating the session. And um, as we are celebrating the 25 years of um, the Sphere, and there will be a cake later on, um, in this panel discussion, um, we will reflect upon the past quarter of the Sphere existence, as what William already mentioned. But also we would like to unpack a little bit, forecasting the future of the humanitarian standard. The big key question, what next for the minimum humanitarian standard? And so to unpack this question, we have our wonderful and excellent uh, panelists to help sharing their view and also to trigger the discussion later on when we have our question and answer. So let me introduce the panelists. First, we have Mr. Nicholas Stockton, one of our Sphere founder. So we are keen to hear uh, from him. He is co-founded the Sphere project in 1997 uh, and was the first executive director of the Humanitarian Account Humanit Hub International, which later merged with the People in Aid uh, to become CHS Alliance. So thank you, welcome, sir. Uh, next, we have Ms. Paula Lynch, director for policy and resource planning in the Bureau of Population, Refugee and Migration, PRM of the U.S. State Department. So welcome, Paula. Next, we have Ms. Susanna Davis, a senior humanitarian advisor at Save the Children and currently the global co-lead of the Child Protection Minimum Standard Working Group at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. So welcome, Susanna. The last two panelists is my dear friend. One is coming from Pakistan. Ms. Tuba Siddiqui, a quality and accountability program coordinator from a CWSA, the first regional partners of Sphere since 2011, and she herself managing the regional Sphere focal point in Asia Pacific. And she is one of the Sphere focal point. So welcome, Tuba. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Mr. Gabriel Godoy Cirillo, a trainer and humanitarian aid member at the Fraternity International Humanitarian Mission. And Gabriel has recent experience of applying Sphere in Brazil, and he has a YouTube channel and posting all the amazing work that um, he do. So we also keen to hear uh, what she's go he's going to share with us uh, today. So let's get started then. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to Nicholas and the same question to all panelists for the first round. Could you share with us, how did you initially engage with Sphere and what is your connection uh, now? So Nicholas, over to you. Oh, okay. Um, it's, um, it, it's quite a treat this. I've, um, I've waited 25 years to get the chance to speak for five minutes. <laughs> and suddenly I get two lots of five minutes. It's pretty wonderful. 
Um, so I have lost lots of sleep wondering what on earth to say in, in this five minutes. Um, and I, I um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go back a bit um, if I can, but I want to start off first of all by, with a little bit of theory. Um, neoclassical economics has it that the market is regulated by the principle of consumer sovereignty. I'm sure you're all familiar with that idea. The problem is when the consumer or the principal in this instance has got no money and no power and the provider of the service or the goods has plenty of money and power, there is a serious risk of two fundamental problems. The first is always referred to as the risk of moral um, uh, um, moral hazard and the second is the risk of inappropriate choice now moral hazard is essentially the problem of corruption um, most of you will probably think of that in terms of financial corruption but of course lots of you also know very well around the issue about the issues of um, sexual exploitation and abuse by aid workers it's another classic example as it were of the problem of moral hazard Inappropriate choice is the when you don't make the decision about who's going to supply you with health care, but you just get get what's given to you. Very often the giver is completely and utterly incompetent and is not necessarily professionally qualified to do the job they're doing. Now, economists predict that where you have circumstances where, where supply and demand in that in, in that relationship between um the providers of um, uh, uh, providers of goods and services, where, where the the receivers of those have no power in the relationship, mm. the prediction it's the firm a firm prediction that you will have these problems happening, and therefore neoclassical econom economists mm. are sort of willing to admit to the idea that a bit of regulation might be a good idea. Mm. Otherwise, of course, we all love free markets because they um, deliver enormous benefits to everybody. At least that's the theory. Well, as William has already said, um, a lot of the thinking about Sphere started in 1994, in August, um, when 1.2 million refugees approximately crossed the border from Rwanda in roughly two days. Now, to meet them um, was a young lad called Filippo Grandi, who at the time was the project officer for UNHCR, and he took on the responsibility over the next few weeks of in the lead agency model of uh, humanitarian coordination of, of um, essentially leading the response there. Um, he was joined a couple of days later on the plane that I went in with, which was carrying Oxfam water equipment. At the time, I was the Oxfam uh, emergencies director. Um, he was joined by the representative from, from OCHA, who, who, who um, had been relatively recently set up, uh, a, guy, a guy that many of you will also know called Charles Petrie, and he was sent in to help advise on coordination. Um, on top of that, and I remember very vividly on the C-14 or whatever it was that we flew in from the UK on, um, there were four or five of us that were sort of supposedly involved in management or technical advice. The rest of it was just full of journalists and press officers. And what happened over the next few weeks, first of all, roughly 60,000 people died under our noses, 30-odd um, thousand, 35,000 from cholera. Um, but what was really different about this is that it happened on real-time TV in a way that had never, ever happened before. It unfolded under our noses, but under the noses of journalists and so on. And it was relayed globally. And often we said at the time that the consequences of this was the sort of end of the age of humanitarian innocence. I mean, it wasn't the first time that sexual exploitation and abuse took place mm. in the humanitarian operation. And it certainly wasn't the first time that incompetent agencies turned up and made a horrible mess of things. But it was the first time that 360 agencies turned up in one place and made an absolute and utter shambles under the TV cameras. Mm. And it destroyed the reputation of the humanitarian system. 
And at the time, those of you that will remember it, well, the main journalistic byline is, what are they doing feeding the killers in the camps? And that's what we were found guilty of. A few of us came back from that, and I've apparently had my five minutes, so um, I will try very quickly to say a couple more points about this. A few of us came back um, and uh, got... Uh, through the offices of the Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response, we got the idea that we really ought to do something about laying out some foundations to address these questions of incompetence and, and moral hazard. And that's really where the Sphere Committee came from. Sorry, the Sphere Project came from. I was its first chair. Um, I co-wrote the, uh, the, the original proposal with Peter Walker, who was the policy director at the IFRC at the time. And you sort of could say, uh, um, you'll, I'll make you happy if I say this, the rest is history. Um, I would have said a bit more, but I haven't obviously got the time. But I, I just add one more sentence or two, perhaps, if I can get away with it. It did become apparent within about three years of the Sphere project in being in existence that the compliance verification, the quality assurance side of it, was not going to get taken forward. And I'll never forget Jim Bishop of Interaction saying to the board, uh, the Project Management Committee meeting, when this question was raised, I think by me, he said, if it attempts to cross the Atlantic, it's going to be dead on arrival. And apologies for my terrible American accent. The, the, the thing in question was the compliance verification mm. element. So I think it was in 70, uh, sorry, in 98, I went along to a World Disasters Report launch in London and said, is anybody interested in doing the compliance verification thing? Because Sphere clearly is unable to proceed with this. And out of that, a couple of other organizations said, yes, let's have a go at this. And we got the humanitarian um, ombudsman project up and running, and that morphed eventually into the humanitarian accountability partnership, which has ended up in the uh, CSW alliance and so on. Um, and then this is my last sentence. I worked for OCHA a few years back now um, on a job looking at the implementation of the transformative agenda, one of these numerous policy initiatives which lie at the bottom of this compost heap of, of policy initiatives that we all managed to completely forget about. That particular one, uh, my job was to wander around, see what's going on, see whether there was effectively compliance with principles of accountability to um, affected people answer not one bit of it not in haiti not in sudan not in south sudan not in pakistan not in uh, afghanistan i went through operation after operation after operation looking really carefully and i was horrified it was worse in most cases than it had been in goma so what went wrong Okay, thank you so much, Nicholas. And again, when we have a co-founder sphere in the in the room, we can always fascinate into all of the history. But also, uh, keen to hear from Paula. Thank you, Nicholas, for for that. Sorry. Over to you, uh, ma'am, for your intervention. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to just read my comments and try to get through them in five minutes so that I <laughs> so I can beat the clock. Uh, the development of the minimum humanitarian standards was originally done in five sectors, water and sanitation, nutrition, food aid, shelter and site planning, and health services. This is the first edition of the Sphere Handbook, and oh. it had cool little separate uh, nice. chapters that you could take out and take with you to the field when you wanted to go to the field. Oh. This was the very first one. This is the most recent one. <laughs> it fits in your pocket or along with everything, and it has everything. You don't have to choose which chapter you're gonna take. Uh, they, they needed to, the, the standards, however, as they were being negotiated, needed to be uh, agreed by both the subject matter experts and by governments. WFP and UNHCR had earlier signed their first MOU where WFP would take on refugee feeding in many operations. And PRM, my bureau, was then uh, responsible for funding some little bits of WFP costs. And so I got involved in looking at WFP and UNHCR and their partnership and food aid and nutrition issues. Um, it wasn't very difficult then for the bureau to decide that I should be uh, involved in the, the development of those minimum standards on nutrition. But I wanna first talk about the context. 
when Nan Bazard first mentioned the idea of working to establish minimum standards for humanitarian assistance, here is some of the context regarding standards that made it such an easy thing to agree to. You may recall We Are the World, the anthem that emerged from a famine in 1985 in Africa. We, the international community, were in the habit excuse me, we're in the habit of doing what we could, but without an agreed way to set targets for what actually needed to be done. In Somalia in 1991, we had seen actual cases of scurvy. You may remember reading history about sailors on ships hundreds of years ago getting scurvy because they lacked vitamin C. This were people who in principle were surviving on humanitarian assistance, but had no access to fresh fruit or vegetables in their diet, and scurvy was the result. We learned the hard way that a hungry person will not eat everything. A hungry, hungry person will not just eat anything. Mm. They, <clears throat> we sent sorghum to the Horn of Africa in the early 1990s, and that did not solve the problem because people didn't eat it. They didn't know what it was or how to fix it. Pellagra broke out in that decade among Mozambican refugees in Malawi. PRM sent cash to UNHCR specifically to purchase peanuts to provide to refugees in Malawi. After the Rwandan genocide, similar to Nick, although I was not on the plane, I was not out there, I uh, recall way too many discussions back in Washington uh, in the debate over how much water actually needed to be provided for the tens of thousands of Rwandans that had sought refuge in Goma, which was then in Zaire, now DRC. Amidst all this, though, on a positive note, the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. had published in 1992 one of their morbidity and mortality weekly reports on humanitarian emergencies that had listed many of the sectors that Sphere later put together. Mike Toole and Phil Nieberg were among two participants from the CDC. In those days, when I held the portfolio for food and nutrition in PRM, uh, I worked I, I was asked to work with the nutritionists that were establishing the minimum nutritional standards. Now, I am not a nutritionist. I negotiate humanitarian issues with agencies and with other countries. But I can assure you with my broadest, most respectful smile that nutritionists are without doubt the most argumentative people on earth. On the minimum daily caloric ration, there was a ton of discussion and debate. One of my favorite nutritionist advocates to deal with was Rita Bhatia of UNHCR. We discussed nutrition for hours. I learned so much that the 1,000 calories per day that you may hear is the minimum standard in order to sustain life. Well, that's true if you're lying in bed doing nothing, which is, as you know, not the case for any forcibly displaced mm. person ever. Mm. And I will admit that I finally learned that agreeing on a minimum standard of 2,100 calories a day was not the result of diplomatic negotiations, but of data and evidence. I'll say more about that in my answer to the second question. PRM, my bureau, and USAID OFTA, which is now BHA at USAID, funded the SPHERE project from its inception in 1997, alongside a host of other government uh, donors, ECHO, the Ford Foundation, Interaction, and various NGOs also contributed. And we have continued to fund Sphere mm -hmm. for 25 years and are in the middle of a grant that we hope will continue on. Uh, so am I, am I good? Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I won't uh, apply any minutes left over to yeah. next. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Give it on a first. Thank you so much. And also thank you for continuing supporting Sphere. And thank you for bringing us and for us to look the first version of the Sphere um, handbook um, into this 25th anniversary. Really, really appreciate it. So now I'd like to turn to Susanna. Um, share with us because you've been engaged also and then you work in the um, uh, uh, colleague of the Global Coalition on uh, Child Protection Minimum Standards. So keen to hear your thought. Over to you. Oh, yep. Thanks very much, Vanda. Um, so I have the, the tall order of coming after Nicholas and Paula, which is a bit of a challenge, but we'll see how we do. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here representing the Child Protection Minimum Standards 
um, and our global working group of more than 40 national and international agencies who are regularly working together uh, to advance the implementation of the child protection minimum standards to measure their impact um, and to learn um, and continue to evolve them over time. Um, and just speaking in that way, I think you can see how perhaps the dynamic around minimum humanitarian standards has changed and evolved over time. Um, the child protection minimum standards has more than a decades long history with SPHERE. And I learned in preparing for this event that the CPMS did not first engage just with SPHERE in the couple of years leading up to us becoming a SPHERE companion in back in 2013, not long after our own standards were launched, but rather several years earlier, when Spear was going through its own revision to strengthen the protection principles uh, mm -hmm. within a newer edition of the Spear standards. And they reached out to the Global Child Protection Working Group for input on those uh, protection principles. And the Child Protection Working Group and its many members submitted so much text and feedback on key issues that ought to be considered that Sphere came back and said, you might well consider developing some minimum humanitarian standards of your own. And we did not look <laughs> after that. Um, as with all minimum humanitarian standards, and I quite liked the way that William uh, spoke about Sphere, saying that they are from the many for the many. Uh, this was very much the case for the child protection minimum standards as well, which went through, I believe at the time, it was a two-year development process involving more than 25 countries and thousands of academics, practitioners, and key stakeholders from around the globe to develop them. As a new humanitarian standard, standards handbook at the time back in 2012 when we were just launched and not long after we signed our companionship agreement and agreed to collaborate with Sphere. Um, collaboration with Sphere was really essential both to learn from Sphere and there were other companion standards at the time as well on their experience of implementing and promoting humanitarian standards. How exactly do you do this? How do you mobilize the mass of humanitarian actors, the number of agencies across the number of, of countries to actually work to implement these standards. It was key to learn from them on that, but also to gain acceptance, uh, to gain validity uh, in the eyes of governments, national partners, and inter international agencies. Um, over time, Sphere has very much evolved into a brand name that helped open doors for the child protection minimum standards. And when we said that we were a companion standard to Sphere, it was a mark of quality and accountability and a mark of how our own standards had been developed. Um, now, years later, the child protection minimum standards have more than 72,000 users. They have been implemented and rolled out in more than 50 countries and translated into 14 languages. We are the second most downloaded humanitarian standards handbook okay. after Sphere, of course. Well done. <laughs> um, over time, our partnership with Sphere has evolved into the establishment of the broader humanitarian standards partnership. Uh, which you heard William mention and Vanda mention, and appreciate the, the plug for the app. So Sphere continues to graciously host the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, where the Child Protection Minimum Standards joins, together with eight other minimum standards handbooks. We really value the Humanitarian Standards Partnership as a critical learning and capacity exchange space and a common forum for the promotion of all humanitarian standards. Minimum humanitarian standards today are a key way that we operationalize our commitment to the rights, protection, and dignity of affected peoples. They are the way that we go from these commitments and these principles, which William described as gray, to actionable, practical steps that humanitarian actors and agencies can take 
and which can be measured and which we can learn from. Mm -hmm. Humanitarian standards certainly need resources and collective action to be implemented. And the Humanitarian Standards Partnership is one forum for advancing mm -hmm. such action. All humanitarian standards go through similar cycles and have similar operational priorities. So through the HSP, we're able to continue learning from each other's successes and challenges when it comes to capacity strengthening around the standards, institutionalization, measurement, implementation, and of course, that all important revision because humanitarian standards do not stand still. Yeah. We learn from practice, we learn from our colleagues around the globe, and we evolve and revise and continue to try to get better. So I think I'll, I'll try and conclude there as my colleagues have already helpfully uh, plugged the Humanitarian Standards Partnership app, but just to note that there are quite a variety of collaborations happening through the HSP and it is a forum that we see as with great possibility and great opportunity for further joint, oper joint action and collaboration in the future. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Susan, and really great to hear about you emphasize on the importance of collaboration and harmonizing all the standards, because we cannot really work in silo, no, we need to collaborate. So ladies and gentlemen, we already hear from the history, we already hear from the donor perspective, as well as uh, from the global perspective from Susan. So our two um, speakers will give us more a little bit grounded sharing their experience uh, from Pakistan as well as Brazil so um, Tuba I go to you first for your intervention and followed by Gabriel thank you very much thank you Wanda um, the order is getting taller <laughs> as we go here um, congratulations first of all congratulations to Sophia on you know the 25th um, being uh, in the sector for 25 years and doing really well uh i'm just going to start with a bit of history and how we started with uh sophia in 2005 uh pakistan had an earthquake uh it was on a vast scale and uh at that time board sphere board um and you know cwsa uh we collaborated uh with each other and sphere board sent our very dear sylvie robert to pakistan uh, to work with us for three months um, and, uh, you know, work with the governments, communities and NGOs on introducing Sphere and how we can um, work uh, on the minimum, uh, keeping in view the minimum standard uh, from Sphere. Um, in 2006, we felt the need after the earthquake, after three months, that we need to learn a bit more on this. Uh, and so we requested, we raised funds for it, and then we requested Sylvie again to come back, to keep on coming back to Pakistan, to give us more information and uh, more capacity, give uh, strengthen our capacity on uh, Safair, as well as quality and accountability mm -hmm. overall. Um, after that, 2006, in 2006, uh, Safair, for, uh, CWSA became the Pakistan focal point for Safair, country focal point, and we started our journey into building capacity of other local organizations on Safair and quality and accountability. Uh, 2011, uh, CWSA became the first regional partner, mm -hmm. uh, and we look at the Asia Pacific region, we did deployments there. We did uh, Safair TOTs uh, on, in Nepal, Japan, Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, um, and we promoted and advocated for Safair um, on the regional level. Um, in 2011, we also uh, hosted a Safair first Safair focal point forum in uh, Thailand, uh, where the Asian region focal points, they came together to again, talk and see where are the challenges, uh, where we can learn from each other. And that this practice had been going on since then, mm -hmm. that after two couple of years, three years, we have this one forum in Asia where we come together, the focal points and um, exchange knowledge with each other. 
uh, we actively support Sophia in setting up the country focal points uh, in the Asia region. We identify, we try and identify um, focal points that can, you know, help uh, promote and advocate for Sophia in the in their own countries and work with local uh, organization as well as the national organization. Um, the fact that the collaboration uh, works so well with Zafir is uh, when we I was talking to, because I'm fairly new, but uh, when I was talking to the organizational management that why, how did we start it and why have we gone with, uh, why the collaboration is so successful. Um, one thing that came from all the management that had been involved with uh, collaborating with Zafir is that um, Safir is has always been in a supporting role, and that had led for the local and had led the local organization to understand, adapt, uh, and initiate any uh, trainings or events uh, around Safir at their own pace. There is no imposition. Uh, they you are you have the time. You have your own pace that you can uh, go forward with. And that had led to a very uh, supportive and uh, you can say a two-way uh, a two-way communication uh, between Safair and uh, CWSA, mm -hmm. where they have been able to have so many focal points and a very successful focal point system at the regional level as well as at the country level, if I say so myself. Uh, and uh, this uh, also connects to what uh, Giles Dooley, if you've been in his session yesterday, that localization will only come if we are in a supportive role. We can't empower uh, people. We can't empower NGOs. We can only support them to help them empower themselves. And we feel that uh, so, so fair role had been uh, in uh, that area where they have been in a supportive role and not in a very imposition uh, role from the, uh, pardon, but from the Western uh, side of the border. So that had been really helpful in, you know, um, pushing us forward and uh, working on these um, uh, thematic areas. Uh, another thing that we do with Safair is that we talk about it in a very humanitarian uh, sector. For we talk about it for the humanitarian sector, but uh, we, uh, as an organization, and we do advocate that it is it can also be seen as something that development sector can adopt uh, in various uh, ways. So uh, for our projects, for our development projects and for other organizations that we work with and their development projects, we do uh, contextualize in a sense that uh, we help them to contextualize in a sense that it can be work, uh, can be seen uh, and worked with development projects as well. So this is what we've been doing currently. We uh, are uh, continuing our work as the regional partner and as a country focal point and uh, our major uh, area had been how to help local organization understand it and adapt it. We've um, translated the uh, versions in Urdu as well as we've helped um, with another focal point Akbar in Afghanistan. We've helped them translate, supported them in translating it in Dari as well. Okay. So that's Thank what you. we've been doing. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, uh, Tuba, and then also for bringing the connection with the localization agenda. Uh, I know that we already hearing so much, but if you can also bear with us because we would like to keen and hear from Brazil. So, uh, Gabriel, offer to you. And if you have any question, please keep it to you, and then we will open later on for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Vanda. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you for all the speakers for Sphere for the opportunity. And on behalf of Fraternity International Humanitarian Missions, it's a pleasure to be here, to be sharing our experience. So my initial, my initial engagement with Sphere started back in December 2020, when I had my first volunteer experience with FIHM in within the Roraima Humanitarian Mission in up north Brazil. It's important to say that by that time, FIHM was already a Sphere focal point in Brazil and became a Sphere focal point in 2021 in Portugal as well. And had already translated the Sphere Handbook into Brazilian European Portuguese. 
Before going to Horaima, it was very important to have an introductory course on this year's standards. So I got on the field already with the initial experience with it. My first role was I uh, was uh, part of the team of livelihoods and durable solutions, which was great. We were uh, working and we were still working with indigenous Venezuelan refugees. So I was, I was in charge of doing correct follow-up of the capacity building courses and making sure the indigenous Venezuelan people were getting the most of the courses and also uh, about the cultural aspect of it. So it was very important to see and to practice the core humanitarian standards and uh, to really know what it means to be accountable to indigenous Venezuelan people by that time. So it was a very important initial experience for me I didn't know much yet about sphere, but was it was a process, you know. By April 2021, I had the opportunity to participate in the first sphere mock. I think it was a preparation for me for the new role that I assumed one month later, on May 2021, as an assistant coordinator in a board refugee shelter in the city of Pacaraima, Brazil. And by that time, you could see like every day the whole book. <laughs> coming into practice because the daily routine of a refugee shelters to be on the field is not easy. A lot of things happen and then you can see protection principles in action, the core humanitarian standards, all the technical chapters. So it's a real, it was a really challenging experience, but very important to really apply and see fear into practice. Well, by August uh, 2022, I had the first opportunity uh, to come to Europe. Uh, to be integrated as part of the Portugal humanitarian mission. And one month later, I became part of the humanitarian capacity building team of fraternity. And then it was an opportunity to bring all this practical knowledge into uh, theory as well and digging deeper into the sphere handbook. And it was like a six month preparation for a one more challenge that we had so on January 2023, we became part of the Poland humanitarian mission. We are currently there uh, working the Krakow area. And on February, we had the opportunity to be on the Sphere uh, stand Standards Workshop in Warsaw. It was a very great opportunity. We're gonna have a next workshop uh, in May and a TOT in June. So Fraternity International Humanitarian Missions along with Sphere, Save the Children Humanitarian Leadership Academy has been part of the Sphere Eastern Europe programming. And it's been very important, you know, to uh, share our practical knowledge uh, into theory and to bring uh, Polish humanitarian agencies and humanitarian professionals into the Sphere knowledge. It was a very important, and I, I'm gonna quote one of the participants uh, speech at the end of the workshop, why this handbook was not in my hands a year ago. <laughs> So I really feel uh, our role as uh, Fraternity International Humanitarian Missions and myself right now part of the humanitarian capacity building team to spread the word and share the knowledge about sphere. So that's what I feel it's our main role and really grateful and happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, and also to really bringing Sphere into practice. So it's not only about the handbook itself, it's not only like a document, but it can be really at value at the field level. So um, building to what we already hear so far, and thank you for all the intervention for the um, first round for the panelists. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Nicholas and then the same, um, uh, uh, what you call it, order. Um, we already heard, considering um, that the growing in the humanitarian sector, a lot of ideas, perspective, even in this event, in the uh, Humanitarian Network Partnership Week, there is a lot of push on improve, strengthening accountability, uh, simplification of the standard. So, Nicholas, what do you like to see for the next, for the minimum standard, both in general, but also uh, in sphere in particular? Mm -hmm. So, over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back a little bit um, again before I will seek to answer the question. Um, but if I go back to my birth uh, 70 years ago, um, there were a lot of organisations here that were sort of existed at that time, but they had, in some cases, slightly different names. Uh, for example, um, the uh, what is now called the British Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in those days was called rather more simply the Colonial Office. It sort of rebadged itself in 1966 
and became the uh, Overseas Development Administration. Another rather important British institution was a thing called the School of Oriental Studies. It was founded in 1916 to train British colonial administrators and the core text for that, uh, uh, for that training uh, was a book called Community Development in the Tropics, written by a guy called T. Batten. Um, it was all about localization, actually, um, remarkably similar to the sort of stuff that actually appears in various parts of Sphere and all sorts of other policy areas. We've kind of been here before, but the point is that these institutions, um, Oxfam was the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief, CARE was the, um, uh, this is perhaps 40 years back, but CARE was at that point the uh, Cooperative for American Relief in Europe post-war. Save the Children Fund had been set up actually principally in re response to the First World War. What all of this was about, more than anything else, was realising how to deal with the costs of imperialism, the costs of warfare, mm -hmm and doing so through a process of socialising those costs and trying to address the damage done by colonialism and imperialism through the voluntary efforts often of uh, people that cared about these things. And that's where a lot of, we, a lot of us come from. Then in 1972, right at the height of the, of the Cold War, when no one in their right minds in our business would have gone anywhere near the United Nations or indeed anywhere near any of the uh, uh, official bodies if they wanted to be accepted as humanitarians, a thing called the Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response was set up in Geneva. And do you know what it was for? It was to coordinate humanitarian response. It's exactly what it said on the tin. And it did it. It uh, spawned a couple of quite effective uh, bodies to focus on particular uh, particular emergencies. The Sahel, for example, um, it created a thing called the Euro Action. Uh, at the end of the Sud first Sudan Civil War, there was an organisation called the um, it was the Accord, um, the Agency for Cooperation and Research and Development for helping reconstruct South Sudan. Um, both of those were came out of the unofficial NGO, if you like, uh, approach to humanitarian coordination. Um, SCH, by the way, uh, SCHR, by the way, I'm not going to go through all the members, but it was a critical thing that both um, the Red Cross movement and the NGOs and the major church bodies were all involved in that. Um, OCHA was established in 1991 during that weird period after the end of the Cold War, when we all thought or were told that it's the end of history. You know, it's a, a, a monopolar world now. No more international conflict is necessary. Ideology is dead. Neoliberalism is won. And we all shut our eyes and foolishly swallowed the proposal that OCHA should be created. And indeed, ever since then, we've been on this cavalcade of ever deepening politicization. So the first thing mm. that Sphere needs to do is to think about independence again. Think about real independence in the sense of uh, the original notion of that in the Red Cross principles and how to operationalize that again. So you can get back again to the places where you want to work and where you can be trusted again. Because as you know, at the moment, you're not. That's why you're gonna be out of Sudan. That's why most of you are out of Afghanistan. The second thing is, Can I have 30 seconds? Yes. Sir. Okay, right. A competent, half uh, numerate um, journalist, if they wanted to get hold of your accounts and the accounts of the United Nations and the consolidated appeals, would very quickly be able to show that well over 50% of the money going into the humanitarian sector is consumed by ourselves, by our consultants, by our, uh, the costs of running, uh, supporting our partners and so on. Very, very little actually escapes in the form of real value that is received by those people for whom those things are raised. This is a room full of people who represent a tax on the humanitarian global budget. OCHA, I think, costs 100 billion a year these days, another massive tax on humanitarian uh, principles and action. My view is this has to end. 
you have to get a more cost effective humanitarian system to really demonstrate that you're worth it. Hey, thank you so much for that note. Cost effectiveness, uh, really, really, um, you know, we love your enthusiasm. Thank you so much, Nicholas. <laughs> now I turn to Paula, the same question about what is uh, you see next for the humanitarian standard. Yeah, over to you, Paula. Okay, thank you very much. I want to emphasize three elements plus a little bit, accountability, localization, data and evidence, and then just a word about cash and cash and voucher assistance. I want to give a shout out first though to the experiences from the ground, the discussion on Pakistan, uh, that Tuba shared and <clears throat> and also on Brazil and Eastern Europe. And then also last week, there was a HNPW session on Nepal and the mm -hmm. application of Sphere in Nepal. I think it's really important to pay attention to how it is applied in the field and, and keep that front of mind. Uh, a key element, so let me turn to accountability. A key element of the SPHERE project from the beginning has been an emphasis on accountability. Mm -hmm. The humanitarian charter and minimum standards served as a practical framework for accountability as stated in its very first edition and offered a way for disaster affected people to review the provision of assistance. We haven't talked a lot about that in the 25 years of SPHERE, but I think the, uh, the actual addition of minimum standards on participation in 2004 and in the incorporation of the core humanitarian standard on quality and accountability in 2018 remains a good and normative foundation for today to work to provide accountability to affected populations or AAP, which uh, is gaining a lot more recognition. I was quite surprised to see that it was so directly stated in the, in the 1998 version. Um, localization, with the broad recognition of the critical role played by local and national first responders, the humanitarian community is working to localize humanitarian response and increase the amount of aid funding that goes directly to local actors. But we need the participation of local organizations to make sure that the minimum standards reflect their own priorities and that they get the job done. Local organizations, funders, and policymakers must also work together to ensure that standards are applied consistently. PRM's current funding to the SPHERE uh, project contrib contributes to this effort through support to locally led adaptation of SPHERE resources, locally led trainings, the establishment of regional and sub-regional networks, and the translation of guidance into more national languages. Uh, translation is really an important part of this. Turning to data, we need to improve our data collection to make it more timely, accurate, and interoperable among stakeholders. We also need to prioritize the integration of the data that we already have into humanitarian response and policymaking. The sphere indicators and monitoring guidance have moved the humanitarian community forward on this, but we need more and better data on humanitarian aid effectiveness and results on migration flows, statelessness, and fragile markets. PRM provides funding to the UNHCR World Bank Joint Data Center to improve the availability of data and promote evidence-based policymaking on forced displacement. So far, that has had a good effect on censuses and making sure that census taking is, is broad enough to include displaced populations. That's just a development that happened in the last several weeks. Finally, on cash and voucher assistance, uh, we know that it is covered in the 28 uh, sphere guidelines. I would suggest that more be done to disseminate and encourage uptake of the minimum standards for cash in a coordinated way while leveraging work already conducted through the Grand Bargain Cash work stream. There have been a number of sessions on cash this week. Uh, I haven't been to all of them, but I was at the one this morning. I think uh, it's really important for us to continue to try to get a grip on how cash changes other things, uh, particularly, and I'll just say this and then leave it, is uh, the issue of protection. And if, if cash is going out to people in a completely neutral way and unseen, is there any impact on the knowledge of people who are there to protect the population? Is there an absence of, of knowledge that they have? Not that they are God and can do everything, but it's important to keep aware of that as we go forward. 
Okay, thank you so much. It's a very valid four points that have been shared by Paula. So, uh, Susan, keen to hear your thought. Over to you. Thanks, Vanda. Um, so for, for humanitarian standards to continue fulfilling their role, I'd like to see three things happening in the near future. And I think perhaps to preface in saying that each of these three, um, I think Sphere and the Humanitarian Standards Partnership have a critical role to play, certainly as a group that can catalyze action. Uh, but it's a role that really needs to continue to be supported by donors, by our member networks, and by collective action uh, with humanitarian actors um, from a huge range of contexts. So first among my three is greater collaboration across sectors and actors to put children and their protection more firmly at the center of all humanitarian action. This is particularly critical because for children, often the root causes of risks that they face in humanitarian crises, risks to their protection and safety can be detected or sometimes responded to in other sectors. The Humanitarian Standards Partnership together with Sphere has a role to play in promoting this cross-sectoral collaboration um, through interoperability of our standards and to strengthen um, the centrality of protection and the protection principles which underpin all of our humanitarian standards handbooks. Just one kind of small recent example um, of such collaborative action, which was born in the HSP, are two new learning modules from the Child Protection Minimum Standards uh, online e-course, which explore partnerships and link humanitarian standards handbooks between child protection and education in one and between mm -hmm. child protection and camp management actors in another. Um, HSP members jointly produced uh, these modules and are promoting them collaboratively. At the Child Protection Minimum Standards, we are investing in a whole range of tools and resources to advance collaboration across sectors for children's protection and well being, aiming to work together in partnership with non protection sectors. Uh, but critically, we do continue to need resources. Um, support and action and engagement from donors in this area where we often see that the way funding is distributed and the way our humanitarian response is often organized still does really encourage the silos. So for our own efforts to bridge gaps between humanitarian standards, there need to be kind of corresponding changes in other elements of the system. Second, I'd like to see greater ownership of humanitarian standards by national and local actors who are critical for standards to be implemented and make an impact. Um, such ownership requires that uh, national and local actors, both government and civil society, are able to play a leadership role in the implementation and revision of standards. Uh, many good examples of this do already exist, and I only have to turn to my left um, to look directly and, and reflect on the experience that Chuba was sharing from Pakistan and in the Asia region, um, and a great element of Sphere's work with country focal points. Um, the Child Protection Minimum Standards has had some experience with this as well in directly funding national and local actors to lead country level activities to roll out and implement the standards. Uh, but I think more action is certainly needed in this area and collaborative work through the Humanitarian Standards Partnership brings the opportunity to pool resources and invest in solutions that increase access to humanitarian standards. So more translation, as Paula was helpfully pointing out, um, and also looking at how we continue to make some of these online platforms and apps that we have more known uh, and accessible to colleagues at the risk country level response. So third, I would say, I really believe that as minimum humanitarian standards, we need to better come to terms with climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been quite a topic of discussion in many sessions here at HNPW this week. Um, and I've been pleased to see a greater attention and greater willingness um, to engage around this issue. 
But now and for decades to come, we know that climate change will continue to cause and exacerbate humanitarian crises. It will contribute and is contributing, it's not a tomorrow problem, but rather one of today, um, to increased conflict and displacement, structural violence and financial hardship, while straining the capacities of local systems to respond. However, many of our uh, minimum humanitarian standards and our humanitarian response model in general are only beginning to consider and adapt to these changes. Sphere's recent production of a nature-based solutions uh, unpacked guide is one example of progress. Um, the child protection minimum standards and the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action have also prioritized climate change and research on the linkages between climate change and children's protection in our current strategy. Um, but more work is needed and more significant changes in our humanitarian standards are needed um, to, to achieve and face, uh, and face this challenge. I think I would plug one more time that um, mitigating and, and responding to climate impacts really does require multi-sectoral and collaborative approaches at, uh, at all levels. Uh, from the child protection minimum standards, we hope that the humanitarian standards partnership can continue to be a place that encourages and promotes uh, this collaboration while also supporting kind of joint learning on how we adapt our sector specific mm -hmm. mitigation and response strategies. Okay, thank you so much, Susanna. And then also to inform us about the newest um, publication from SPEAR and the Unpacket of Nature-Based Solution. Uh, I know we are almost running out of time, but we also keen to hear from Tuba. So uh, Tuba, over to you and then Gabriel. I'll be quick. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, my asks or my uh, ideas are like quite uh, simpler, simple at this point because we know already know that uh, Sphere has started these digital courses uh, recently with uh, one hour digital courses and we are moving towards digitize, uh, digitizing uh, catalyzed by the COVID circumstances. So that's good, at least in our part of the region. Um, however, uh, with digital training, uh, we would uh, like to say, like uh, Susanna has mentioned, that language is one of the barriers for a lot of uh, local NGOs when they are um, accessing these minimum standards. Uh, and it it's not just that we translate the book, but also they lo lose an opportunity with uh, communicating with other um, organizations or uh, through webinars or training when the all these material are only available in English. Mm -hmm. So my uh, uh, I, uh, my suggestion would be to have it uh, translated in as many languages mm -hmm. as possible. Country focal points are already mm -hmm. doing so much, but it's a voluntary role. Mm -hmm. So we do need support. Uh, in terms of uh, finances and in terms of, you know, thinking through uh, how to uh, go about it. So there's one, uh, as far as the digital trainings are concerned, they're great, but it does, it's not a substitute for a human interaction. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're always pushing towards, uh, especially with local organization, mm -hmm. because it's not just eight hours of training that you're with them, uh, with them, but it's after the training happens. There's a still a uh, exchange of knowledge, uh, which is continues. So that's important, and we must continue it. And how, in some way, if we can join these two together and to start um, pushing it, uh, pushing universities to adapt uh, Sophia in in their courses. Uh, that would be great. We've already started with uh, some uh, one or university in Afghanistan. We're in conversation with them and in Pakistan as well. But it's a process, I know. But if uh, we can do that, I think it's really uh, necessary uh, for the next generation to know more about it because uh, we've seen in the past, uh, in Pakistan, the last before 2022, uh, big floods. The last floods was in 2010 mm -hmm. and 11. And between that time period, we lost a lot of, you know, there was a lot of brain drain, uh, a lot of people who were familiar with these uh, standards and professionally were working on this. Um, 
So we would like that there has to be a continuous um, building of capacity, strengthening of capacity, and enhancing of capacity. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tuba. Uh, Gabira, I'm sorry to put you on pressure for two minutes so we can able to have at least question from the audience, and we'll get back to the panels later on. Thank you. So as a young humanitarian practitioner, uh, to be honest, what I see ahead of us is a future somehow of crisis, emergencies, high scarcity scenario, you know, food scarcity, power outages, all consequences of armed conflicts, of natural disasters, and a strong need for humanitarian response, for humanitarian aid. And what guides us through this process in order to uphold dignity for the community affected people are the, are the minimum standards, the minimum humanitarian standards. So I'll uh, just quick and complementing the other speakers, my colleagues, to the broad definition of it. And if universal and qualitative, we must have a strong, uh, stronger geographical expansion, not only for sphere, but also for the other humanitarian standards partnership. Mm -hmm. Sphere has done a lot over the last 25 years. It's currently present in more than uh, in the five continents, six, nine focal points, 49 members, over 100 third trainers, but it has room for more in regions like Africa, Middle East, Central America. It has room for way more. Also common language. So it's not only about translation, as Tuba was saying, but the way we write it, how accessible is it to people to actually uh, have like the handbook in their backpack, as William was saying, with the toothbrush and a phone charge. So we have to do more into the common language as well. Yeah. Involvement with other sectors of society. Here we're talking about public sector. We bring the case of Ecuador institutionalizing, institutionalizing sphere standards into its uh, NDMA authorities, uh, which has been great. Also involvement with university, as Tuba was saying, careers like nursery, environmental engineering, social services, is strengthen their curriculum through the sphere standards so that young people, mm -hmm. it's important to say that through, throughout its 25 affiliates, Fraternity International Humanitarian Missions has trained since 2020 over 1,500 people ready to act in crisis and emergency scenarios throughout Brazil and Latin America. So we're talking about young people. Uh, it is important, this kind of engagement. If we're talking about quality, I'll already finishing my speech. Uh, we're talking about quality and accountability. A uh, great example we bring is the CHS Revision Writing Group, which has been very great and FIHM is being part of it. And uh, capacity building, uh, as a capacity building now uh, volunteer for FIHM is important as Tuba was saying to go beyond the training itself to you know uh, get to know more about other e-learning strategies, follow-ups, the mentorship approach. So all of that is very important because at the end of the day, it's all about dignity to uphold community affected people dignity. So that's what we should always stand for and never forget about it. Thank you so much for reminding us on that. And also the engagement of the NDMA is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, we already hear so much, very rich um, explanation, few perspective from the panelists. Uh, we have five minutes at least for a question and answer because before we have the cake, uh, because this is an anniversary. But we would like to hear from you. So if anybody have a question, a comment, need to be pre precise on your question or comment. Uh, yes, sir. And then please also introduce yourself. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Raju Thapa from Nepal. Uh, and we have been translating Sphere Standards since 2004. And uh, we have translated uh, four companion standard of uh, sphere standard, that is education standard, market recovery, economic analysis, and inclusion. And we have conducted international training and prepared adequate human resource in Nepal. And we also engage a series of uh, program to collect feedback from more than 3,000 stakeholders on upcoming new CHS revision, uh, revision and provided comprehensive feedback to the CSS Alliance already. Uh, last year, we sensitized uh, around uh, 19,500 local govern government officials on a sphere standard uh, through government-led training program. We also contributed, contributed uh, we also contributed to distribute over 3,000 sphere handbook to 753 local governments of Nepal. Uh, in order to grab the attention of the community people, 
uh, we developed some innovative tools okay. like folk songs, street drama, uh, storytelling. Uh, these tools, you know, were powerful to grab the attention of the local people. And uh, I think our recent localization effort can be considered as a massive localization effort in the mm -hmm. history of a sphere standard because within a year we reached more than nine, 19,500 okay. local governments official. We sensitized them. Uh, uh, and I think we need to create a, a community of practice uh, to discuss and share our lesson learned and good practices so that all the focal points can be benefited okay. because we have been doing many outstanding things in our area and we are very familiar with virtual platform. We can utilize that platform to share and learn our good practices. Okay, okay. Let's be creative uh, and uh, try to find innovative way to uh, sensitize community rather than focusing on bulky okay. book. Uh, our standards should be simple and easy to understand by every single member okay. of the community. And last but not least, disaster prone and populous, populous country like India should be engaged to cover mass population. This, mm -hmm. is, my, this is our recommendation. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. It's kind of like more on the comments. Thank you very much and appreciate all the work, amazing work in Nepal. Any, yeah, uh, Madam, and then Madam, and uh, we will come back to the panelists. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Anna Farina. I work for Start Network. Uh, um, and I wanted to ask a question about if you're planning to include into the standard anything about um, anticipatory action and if this is a plan already uh, for, for the committee. Okay, thank you. Madam? Yeah, thank you. Bon anniversaire. <laughs> My name is Sylvie Robert. I'm a consultant, independent consultant, Nick. Um, I'm a little bit surprised here. I mean, I've lived with fear and I love fear and we've done so much since the end of the 90s. And what I'm hearing is not going in the right direction at all. Nick, I don't think we can get independent again from the project perspective. And what I would like to ask all of us to think of is when you say what next, it's the first time or one of the first times I'm not hearing about an exit strategy. I'm hearing about growing and getting more power. And I'm really, really happy to see that we have Tuba from CWS Asia. We have Gabriel, we have the colleagues from Nepal, and they're only quoting how they use this and how they want to be involved in consultations. Mm. So my question is, when will we be truly accountable mm. and shift the power? and stop what we are doing. Paola, please continue funding, yes, but localized in the hubs, in the regions. And I'd like to recall one thing, I was contracted for 18 months to close the Reach Out project in 2004. It's, it was a training project on refugee protection. We were given 18 months to think about how we would close and ensure that it would be mainstreamed, which was the objective of Sphere from the beginning, no? Yeah. Mainstream, ensure it is used, it makes a change, and then this is fine. <laughs> so thank you for the blue binder and the good reminder on this. Oh. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We have a two question, and I will turn out to all the panelists, and then if you can able to also end up with your final key takeaways, because we are at the end of the session, and thank you for the question. Maybe I'll start with uh, Susan, you're already ready to speak. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm fully ready to speak, but I'll, I'll certainly give it my go. Um, I think first, uh, responding to the colleague who's asking about an exit strategy, I find it a really perplexing question. In any other sector, in any other field, um, do you think that they don't have standards, that there are, isn't technical guidance that people, that people use or regulations that regulate industries? Humanitarian standards are just that. And I would hardly say that humanitarian standards are owned by um, 
international and Western agencies, certainly the development process of SPHERE and of the child protection uh, minimum standards and of the other standards in the humanitarian standards partnership has been hugely participatory mm -hmm. and they are tools that have been developed. Um, I hope William doesn't mind me repeatedly quoting him uh, for from the many for the many. Um, so I think talking about an, an exit strategy for the existence of humanitarian standards wouldn't uh, wouldn't be something that I would prioritize. Certainly greater localization, absolutely. Um, certainly um, more models like the one that Sphere is using with funding country focal points and supporting country focal points and regional focal points uh, from national and local organizations to uh, take the charge in and, and work on both institutionalization and um, and capacity strengthening of national and local actors. But I think humanitarian standards are are a core are core part of how we are held accountable. Um, and I would like to see them become more operationalized to to hold the humanitarian sector accountable. Um, I think. Um, I I know I don't have a lot of time, and I'd like rather to to cede that time to to other colleagues um, rather than going into the the list of key actions that I had hoped to promote in my last minute. But I would just say that I I think it's very important to underline from this panel that minimum humanitarian standards have positively changed the humanitarian landscape since the Sphere Handbook first edition was published 25 years ago, and I hope they will continue to do so. Okay, thank you so much. We will only have like one more response, and then can I turn to Paula uh, before I will need to give William for close the session. Yeah, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, rather than give what I thought I would give as the last minute, I'll just reinforce some of the things that I've heard other people say that I think were really useful today. One is that Sphere should remain independent and that it should remain attentive to the things that come with independence. Another is greater collaboration across sectors. I think that's really important. I think that gets us into trouble a lot. Uh, we need greater ownership by national and local actors. That's what I tried to say in my second uh, question answer. Uh, and clearly we need more translation, more online platforms, more uh, more training at the local level. Mm -hmm. And climate change is something that is so big, it's going to be very difficult to figure out how to boil that down. It's probably going to be something that gets integrated into each mm -hmm. of the sectors rather than uh, rather than say this, here's the sector of climate change, but that's going to have to be done too. I think the emphasis on, on dignity is really crucial. Uh, that goes along with localization. It goes along with not thinking that you have the answer because you have the standard and therefore you know exactly what to do in this small community. It means that you know what's needed and then you have to figure out how to make it contextually relevant with dignity for the community that you're dealing with. So that's okay. Thank say. you so much. On the question on the start network, we will answer later on from with the uh, Spirit Secretariat. But thank you so much for all the your passion in hearing of the perspective from the, the panelists and also some of the question. Uh, if you you know that we have a Spirit booth as well in this uh, event, if you would like to continue engage with us and have more experience to share and then question, feel free to reach out to us uh, and meet us at the Sphere booth. And so I would like to, and thank you for all the panelists for all your great uh, perspective and, and, and views. And I would like to turn over to William for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, panel. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas, for coming. I know this is a very busy time of your life, but thank you for coming and sharing. We've really valued it. And Paula, the support from the US government has been invaluable, more than you can possibly know, and thank you for the continuing it. Um, I'd like to, at the moment now, just to thank the Sphere team, the Secretariat. So Roma, Amanda, Anina, Fred, Felicity, and Tristan, please stand up. Please stand up. And, and those who have worked for Sphere, I know there's a few people here who have used to work for Sphere, including Tanya at the back, but who, those who worked for Sphere, please also stand up as well. Thank you so much for your work before. Yeah. So your yeah, DP network, um, ID, thank you for being here. Um, Maher, 
Thank you for being here. Please stand up. And also, so if you're a focal point and if you're a trainer, please stand up. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you. And yes, from Bangladesh, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much. Um, for our supporters, our partners, including CHS Alliance, but IFRC, SCHR, etc., and our members, we want to thank you as well for your continued support. So if you are one of those people who support Sphere, please stand up. <laughs> and finally, to our governing board, um, you give your time, you give your expertise, you give your service. And to, to Rita, thank you so much for all your hard work this last year. I know it's been difficult at times, but thank you so much. Rita is now, who is our president, Rita is now going to cut the cake. So, so, so let's give a round of applause to Rita first. And then let's, let's join Rita as she cuts the cake. Thank you. Yeah. No, 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 it's not. 